not um, I know it's not necessarily the greatest situation in different parts of the world. Uh, so I just I wish you guys all the best. And the second thing I want to say is obviously yes, education as an agent partner for for Tiwa for TAFE International Western Australia in the grand scheme of things is a relatively new agent partner and we haven't really had an opportunity. I certainly haven't really had an opportunity to engage with you guys as much as I would like to have done. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I said that last time I met with you all. That's very much to do with COVID. And I think in the lead up to COVID, we were all just so busy. There was AIEC, there was all, all sorts of things happening. And now, unfortunately, there's COVID. So we can't meet face to face. We can't do expos and things like that. But I would hope that as we start coming out of COVID, we can get some momentum together. Um, Absolutely. Yes, education. Yeah. So I'm quite excited about that. I think WA has got a lot of opportunity as has TAFE WA and as has WA government schools. So let's get into it. Uh, any questions, chuck them in the chat box. And Bo, Ivy, just interrupt me anytime you want to. Yeah. And uh, particularly if audio and um, everything's stuff, good stuff from drops now. out. So you guys can all see that screen? Yes. yes. I think if it's okay, I'm going to turn my video off unless you'd like to see my face at the same time as my beautiful slides. <laughs> yeah. My preference would be that you focus on the slides, if that's okay yeah. with you. <laughs> mm -hmm. So today I'm going to talk to you, I uh, just want to turn my laser pointer on. You see, normally what I would do is I would normally do individual sessions, one for TAFE, one for WA Government Schools. I'm going to try and combine them all into one for you guys today, which uh, is going to make for quite a lot of information you know, don't worry if you don't absorb it all. We're here to help come to us with questions, particularly around government schools. I know it's a very complicated product, but it is a good product. And we are trying to work with our partners at the Department of Education on simplifying the product, uh, particularly for when uh, the market starts coming back to Australia. So, so stay in touch with us. Uh, we're here to help. But across WA government schools and TAFE International Western Australia and Western Australia generally, just remember we are all about quality, we are all about affordability, and ultimately beyond school and beyond TAFE and beyond university here, it's about employability, it's about options here and opportunity here in Western Australia. TAFE International Western Australia is the office I am with. We are part of the Department of Training and Workforce Development. Our focus is TAFE, but on behalf of the West Australian Government Department of Education, which is a sister department, on behalf of them, we recruit for WA government schools as well as TAFE Western Australia. And I'm sure you know that already. I just want to make sure of that. Let's have a quick look at Western Australia and Perth, first of all. Ivy's already mentioned around about two and a half million people across the state of uh, Western Australia, and that is uh, about accurate. The vast majority of those live in the city of Perth, about 80 to 90% of that population lives in the city of Perth. So you're talking about a population of about 2 million. That's the city in the background. You know, there are five big cities in uh, Australia, as you probably know. There's uh, Melbourne over here, there's Sydney, uh, there's Brisbane up here, there's Adelaide, and there's Perth. And that's not in any particular order, but those are considered to be the five major cities. And Perth, really, as the capital of Western Australia, I think is a pretty special city across those fives. And hopefully I can tell you some of the reasons why. Obviously, we're the capital of Australia's largest state, number one. I mentioned affordability already. According to The Economist magazine, Perth is officially Australia's most affordable city. That's a very important point to remember for international students looking to save a dollar. Whether they are coming into Australia after COVID or whether you have students already here in the numerous government and private school systems around Australia who are now coming potentially to the end of their studies and looking to extend their studies in Australia. Remember that Perth is the most affordable city in Australia. So if you've got students who are looking to explore their options after school or even after university or after vocational studies in the other parts of Australia, have a think about Western Australia. Lots of opportunity, very affordable. Obviously one of Australia's most livable cities as well. Uh, in fact, pretty much all five of the major cities here are considered to be one of the world's most livable cities. But we have, as Ivy said earlier on, that regional designation that sets us apart, apart from those other four major cities. So across the five major cities, we are the only one with a regional designation. In terms of flights and time zones, uh, this point here really applies mainly to students uh, 
coming from uh, other countries, coming into Australia rather than students who are onshore. It's obviously very easy to connect around uh, Australia internally, notwithstanding state border closures with COVID breakouts and things like that. But in terms of flights and time zones and connectivity to Southeast Asia, same time zone as Kuala Lumpur, same time zone as um, other parts of Southeast Asia. I was going to say Taiwan, but you probably don't have uh, too much of a, of a connection or, or market in Taiwan. But in terms of other countries, Vietnam and Indonesia, we are basically only one hour's time difference. And in fact, with Indonesia, there might even be uh, parts of, of uh, the Western parts of Indonesia that are in the same time zone, but I think we are one hour uh, ahead. But that makes it very, very easy to stay in touch with family. It makes it very comfortable to connect here. There were discussions before COVID-19 around uh, getting Vietnam Airlines and also Bamboo Airways to connect here into Perth directly from Ho Chi Minh City. Those conversations obviously uh, went a bit stale with COVID, unfortunately. Aviation took a big hit. We are expecting those conversations to, to come back. There is a rapidly growing Vietnamese community here in Western Australia, in addition to obviously strong Malaysian community, strong Indonesian community. I'll show you some uh, diversity um, sort of uh, data in a minute. But along with affordability, livability, and that regional designation, the most important thing I think is this word balance. Perth is a very balanced city. Just like the rest of Australia, we have a world-class education system here, lots of part-time employment opportunities, and around Perth and the rest of Western Australia, fantastic things to see and do. But it comes back to that point about balance. I'm a former international student myself to Australia. I came from Africa. And that word, having spent eight years living in London after I finished studying in Australia, I can tell you now, there is nothing more important for an international student than balance life balance between part-time work, social life, and studies. So you've got to come to somewhere that presents a combination of everything. And I think Perth really does present that combination of everything. Uh, a few pictures for you of Perth. Uh, you might look at this picture and think this is out in the countryside somewhere. This is uh, only two kilometers down the Swan River from the CBD of Perth. This is the famous Blue Boathouse. So this is actually very close to the CBD which looks like this. As you can see, it's a very dynamic, uh, very exciting looking city center. About 25 minutes from the city center, we have Cottesloe Beach. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think, Bo, you're originally from Sydney. You probably are, I think, if I've got yes, that right. Yes, that's right, Sydney. So you probably tell everybody about the, the wonders of Coogee Beach and Bondi Beach. But uh, for anybody who's been uh, to, to Sydney and seen Bondi Beach, it's a great, it's a great beach in Sydney, but it's usually full of people and it's Quite difficult to swim there sometimes, I think, anyway, <laughs> personal preference. This is Cottesloe Beach. This is about 25 minutes from the CBD of Perth. Much quieter, much more accessible uh, by, by train and by public transport and car. And um, really a great place to spend a weekend with fellow students and friends and also a great place to get part-time work. There are lots of restaurants and cafes in that area. Another picture of the CBD for you. And here is a, a, a sort of a picture of what we call the Perth Cultural Precinct of Northbridge. And officially, the Perth Cultural Precinct, we're very proud that TAFE Western Australia's Northbridge campus is officially part of the Perth Cultural Centre, which consists of the West Australian State Library, the West Australian State Theatre, the West Australian State Gallery, the West Australian State Museum, and our very own TAFE campus in Northbridge, officially part of the Cultural Centre. But outside Perth, if you go up the coast a little bit to the north, fantastic coastline, great stuff to see and do. If you go down to the south, you will get to do things that are really quite unique to the southwest corner of Western Australia. This is the famous treetop walk in a place called Walpole. And on this treetop walk, you will get to walk through the canopy of a forest that is made up of trees that don't exist anywhere else in the world. Not Australia, the world. But if you don't want to go too far out of town, this is the Swan Valley. This is about half an hour's drive from the CBD of Perth a very popular place for people to go and take uh, wildflower pictures during spring uh, for their Instagram accounts. Up in the north of Western Australia, we've got Karajini National Park. We've got Margaret River, which is uh, about three hours south of Perth, a very famous tourism hotspot, famous for its wineries and its hospitality. 
uh, and its uh, international surfing competitions as well. And we have a campus down there in Margaret River, not far from where this picture is taken, which is of Voyager Estate. And back to the CBD of Perth, this is a slightly newer picture than the one I showed you earlier on. And you can see this area that we call Elizabeth Key. Here's the conference center. There's a train station right next door. Uh, the CBD in the background with lots of major corporation headquarters like uh, Rio Tinto and uh, BHP Billiton. Uh, and here we see a new um, Ritz-Carlton hotel development, which opened uh, just before COVID struck, and it's actually doing really well with, with local tourism. So this whole area has been earmarked. There's a Doubletree Hotel here now. There's a, a Western Hotel just in the background. This area is really earmarked for a, a rapid hospitality expansion. And just outside the CBD is Australia's number one sporting arena. Perth Stadium. And in fact, Perth Stadium uh, won an award in 2019 for the world's best uh, sports stadium. It's an architecture prize that's awarded in France, the Prix Versailles. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it awarded the Perth Stadium the number one prize in 2019 for architecture. The reason why I show you this stadium is because you, you've got to understand there's a lot of activity happening in Perth, not just sport, but entertainment. And what comes with that is opportunities for students to get part-time work. Lots of catering, lots of cafes, lots of bars, restaurants. In fact, Western Australia's largest pub is just outside the stadium over here. What else is going on? We've got, just like the rest of Australia, lots of fringe festivals, lots of outdoor festivals, particularly during summer, lots of, lots of cultural celebrations. Um, the fringe festival, again, is very, very popular for students who want to get part-time work. Uh, we have things like night markets. There's a lot happening in Perth. So let's go on to WA government schools. I don't think there've been any questions so far, but that's great. Feel free to ask them. We'll uh, obviously answer them at the end. Let's get stuck into WA government schools. It's a complicated product, and I want to try and simplify it today, but it is, it's, it's very easy to oversimplify it because there are some nuances and and complex things that you need to get your head around. Again, don't worry if you don't absorb it all today, we are here to help. Um, and we are working with the Department of Education on trying to make it more uh, simple for our agent partners to, to sell to students, because when you compare it to competitors, it can on paper look like it's not necessarily a very competitive product, but it's actually a very competitive product, except for one thing which we are working on, and that is the price. We'll come to that in a minute, but we are going to look at uh, our fees that we're charging. And hopefully by the time students start coming back from overseas, we'll have a revised and more competitive pricing structure. But anyway, WA government schools. Um, WACE, what is WACE? West Australian Certificate of Education. Very, very much a standard certificate of education across the rest of Australia, Victorian Certificate of Education, South Australian Certificate of Education. They're all very, very similar. And what they do uh, as education systems across the different states is they turn out students who either have what's called an ATAR or they either finish school as a non-ATAR or general student. So if you finish school with an ATAR, that typically means you're trying to get into university. It's not necessarily an exact science, but usually a student with an ATAR is trying to get into university. ATAR stands for Australian Tertiary Admissions Rank. It's a rank, not a percent score, it's a rank. It, it puts you against fellow students and tells you where you're sitting on that rank. And that rank can determine what courses at university you are able to enter. But non-ATAR or general students can also go into university in a range of different ways. In fact, universities are being increasingly flexible around this. But most students who come into TAFE from WA government schools will be non-ATAR or general students. And they've often done some vocational qualification in their school years. And their school years will basically be uh, 13 years from kindergarten all the way up to year 12, what we call a K to 12 system. Now, most international students won't be coming in kindergarten. They, in the majority will come around about year nine, sometimes year eight, sometimes year 10, but around about year nine. So primary school is approximately from five years old to 12 years old. It's what we call kindergarten to year six. Secondary school is approximately from 12 years old up to 18 years old. 
and it's what we call year seven to 12. Within year seven to 12, secondary school, is lower secondary and upper secondary. Upper secondary is effectively year 10, 11, and 12, okay? So that's secondary school, um, and that's where most international students typically will come. The terms, they are four of them. They run from mid-January to late December. Summer here in Australia is in January, so that is the start of the academic year. So mid-January to late December is when the school term runs. On a day-to-day -day basis, students can expect to be in class about five days a week, usually from about 8.30 to uh, 3.30. I'm just going to go back. I've just remembered why I was hesitating uh, on ages here. I just wanted to say something that's just come back to me, which is that the Department of Education here in Western Australia is very particular about uh, ages and what years those students are eligible to enroll in. So any questions come to me. I have a little grid, an age matrix, if you like, that will uh, allow you in a very quick way to look at what year your students should be starting. So come to me for, for that answer. But the Department of Education is very strict on ages. And really, from 18 and above, students end up going into what we call senior campuses rather than a standard WA government school. They're still WA government schools, but they're what we, are, they're what we call uh, senior campuses, okay? So five days a week, 8.30 to 3.30, it's pretty structured. Classes vary in size, but really no more than 25 to 32 students in a class. Uh, it's already an, already, an, already an obvious point that we are a government-owned school system. And what the school system aims to do across all of its schools is develop this the sense of culture and, and positive environment for students, both Australian local students and international students. And when we say local students, we're not talking about the typical blonde hair, blue eyed Australian. Obviously, yes, there are lots of Caucasian people in Australia, but there are also a lot of very diverse nationalities in Australia that are locals, permanent residents, Australian citizens. Many have been born here, many have migrated here. So when we talk about local and international schools, uh, sorry, local and international students, to be honest, in my opinion, that really just refers to something on paper. They're all school students and they all come from diverse backgrounds. Australia has a great diversity in students and it's not just uh, local and international students. That local student population also consists of Aboriginal Australians who are incredibly important to the diversity in the classroom. Great facilities and expertise being government owned, of course, you can expect to be, your students can expect to be in a school system that is very well equipped, uh, being taught by students, uh, to, being taught by teachers who have a lot of experience and background. There is quite a lot of diversity and choice across the schools. Uh, so different types of schools do different things. Some schools focus on certain areas, whether it's arts or sports or science, but there is quite a lot of diversity. Uh, so come to me with help. Uh, choosing a school if you need it. But in fact, you'll find that a lot of parents already through word of mouth or friends and family have an idea of where they want their student to go. Each school that delivers to uh, international students typically has an international student coordinator on hand at the school to help with the students. And when you get into the schools, there are quite a lot of subjects to choose from. I'll show you some of those in a minute. But I mean, it's the standard stuff that most schools around the world um, deliver. We do for international students also have something that is unfortunately named IEC, International, uh, sorry, Intensive English Centre, IEC. We are looking at rebranding that, uh, and I'll touch on that more in, a, in just a moment. I think there's something on my next slide about it, but if there isn't, I'll come back to it. But IEC, Intensive English Centres, are basically where international students will be learning their English when they come to WA government schools. But English continues throughout the studies, even outside the um, Intensive English Centre. We do have ESL, English as a Second Language. So most of our uh, schools have, or most of our popular schools with international students have IECs attached to them, international, sorry, Intensive English Centres. In terms of support outside the school, that is managed very well by our welfare team here in the Tiwa office, okay? So between our welfare team and the individual 
uh, coordinators at the schools and the teachers. It's all focused on individual outcomes and broad learning and building confidence for those students so that they can progress through the education system here in Australia. And in fact, you'll be glad to know that last year's International Student of the Year in Western Australia was a Vietnamese school student from Kent Street Senior High School. Fantastic student who I think is on her way to the University of Western Australia on, if I'm not mistaken, a scholarship. Students do need to achieve what's called ULMA in their studies. This is the online literacy and numeracy assessment. It's fairly straightforward and it is, I believe, fairly easy to achieve. Not easy, but, but straightforward to achieve. Most students will achieve it. All students, local and international, have to achieve that to uh, secure their West Australian Certificate of Education. So English, maths, science, humanities, arts, languages, physical education, technology, they are all basically available at all of the schools. But students typically, as they get to the pointy end of their studies, will start focusing on three or four subjects. Some schools focus on what's called STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. Others on what's called STEMA, which is uh, obviously science, technology, engineering, maths, and arts. Arts is very, very important, increasingly important in a lot of students' lives and in a lot of schools. People are looking for critical thinking, creative thinking. Uh, and when I say people, I'm talking about employers. It's not just a matter of saying, hey, I've got an engineering background. It's also a matter of saying, I can think creatively. I can think critically. And you can only really learn that in the humanities area. So arts and humanities should not be underestimated. Now, back onto intensive English centers. Something I really want to stress here that is very important. There is a perception with some students and parents and, and agent partners that intensive English centers are exclusively English and have to be done before the student can progress with their school studies. And that is not the case. It's very important to note that intensive English centers deliver English tuition together with West Australian Certificate of Education subjects. So it's delivered concurrently or at the same time as the schools, the school students' studies. And those IECs, as rigid as they may appear to be on paper, on an offer, are actually very uh, tailored to students. So sometimes we prescribe 40 weeks, but more often than not, it turns out to be less and students often transition out of IEC into the mainstream schooling um, in much less than 40 weeks, sometimes 20 weeks. So students are individually assessed when they arrive at the school and uh, a prescribed amount of English can be given to that student that might be different to what was initially offered. Now, we are looking at revising this system it is what it is at the moment. So typically what you can expect is a blanket prescription of 40 weeks on an offer. But bear in mind that that 40 weeks is going to be taught concurrently with academic subjects. And bear in mind that when the school student starts their studies, a lot of the time that 40 weeks is reduced and the student exits and carries on with mainstream studies. And so obviously the fees for IEC are, are reduced at that point. So it might look like a very fixed, unmovable object before the student starts, but actually behind that, once the, once the student enrolls, is uh, a much more flexible system tailored to meet individual student needs. The process, and I'll show you some of the web pages in just a moment, um, where you can find a lot of information. And of course, as I said, come to me uh, or come, come through IV to me for directions to the different web pages. But the process is quite straightforward. It's basically choose a school, prepare the documents and apply online. Obviously, within those three steps, there are, uh, there are lots of uh, things you need to do and, and lots of work, but that's, eff that's effectively how simple it is. And as you can see here that uh, the, by the fees, when a student enrolls into school, if a student is doing IEC 
uh, in conjunction with their mainstream studies, the fees are a little bit higher. This is the fee over here with English as a second language. But when a student is in IEC, it is a little bit higher, typically about $3,000 more than mainstream studies. So let's say a student comes and joins in January 2022, and they've been given uh, four week, uh, 40 weeks of English on their offer. That student basically goes into, let, let's use lower secondary here as an example. That student will go into their, let's say, year nine, and they are going to be looking at around about 20,000, uh, just over $20,000 for their um, their one year of study in year nine. Now, obviously, that doesn't get all paid up front. It gets paid by term. And let's say after two terms, the student reaches a level of English that is adequate and they don't need to be an IEC anymore. They will then go on to the mainstream fee. So they don't end up paying any more for the IEC later in the year. They transition directly into the mainstream uh, area. Now, this is all well and good. If you have any students enrolling with us uh, anytime this year, but actually going forward into 2022, I have a feeling based on what the Department of Education is saying, I have a feeling, and it's quite an exciting feeling, that IEC fees are hopefully, I can't confirm this, but there, there is discussion about this fee basically being removed so that IEC becomes part of the mainstream fee, okay? I'm hoping. We'll have to see how that goes. Uh, so in other words, whether you are studying mainstream or IEC plus mainstream, it should not matter. You might be in, you might be basically paying the same fee. So I'll confirm that when that happens. I'm optimistic that's going to come into place for 2022. One of the great advantages of being a government provider across TAFE and uh, Department of Education, of course, is, is quality of product. But unfortunately, one of the great disadvantages, of course, is the time it takes to respond to market needs. So things like this can take a little bit of time, but just bear with us. You know, it, it's worth it in the end. Students, uh, the outcome that you have as a student coming out of the WA government school system is very, very positive. So where can you find critical information on our website? By all means, please come through Ivy or me directly, whatever it is. Um, to find information, we are all here to help. Uh, but if you do go onto the website, you will see there is a public schools link at the top. And if you click on that, you will see a little section down here that says student visa holders, uh, 500 or 571 visas. That is the section to go to, to find out more about a straight applicant who's basically coming to school as an international student. And under that link is application process and also available schools. If you clicked on available schools, you will come to a page that tells you what the available primary schools are and what the available secondary schools are. And I can send this list around through Ivy. It's not a problem. You don't have to go and find it. But we have a lot of schools available on the website. And then the question we get asked a lot about is accommodation for school students. So again, if you clicked on public schools, you'd see accommodation. Um, actually, this could be under the help and advice section. Sorry about that, I might, miss, I might have misled you. So click on either one of those. I've got a feeling this is under help and advice, but if you go to uh, accommodation, you will see under 18s. So this little red circle should be around help and advice. Accommodation, under 18s, and this brings us to this page here, which I get asked a lot about, which is accommodation for under 18 students, particularly school students. Now, there are basically three options. Option one is living with a parent in Australia, okay? Or a legal guardian as well. Option two is living in Australia with a blood relative over the age of 21. And that blood relative can be nominated by the parent or legal guardian to be looking after that student. So that's the second option. Now, option three is about homestay. The question I get asked a lot is, hey, I've got a student and they want to go and live with a family friend or a cousin or whatever it is. A cousin, by the way, doesn't count as uh, a close blood relative. Um, it has to be someone like a, an aunt or an uncle or a brother or a sister. But option three, I get asked a lot. People say, oh, can, I've got the student. Can they stay with a friend or a, you know, 
a distant family member? And the answer is yes, they can, but that friend or cousin or distant family member has to register as part of the Australian Homestay Network. So option three is effectively about Australian Homestay Network. So it can either be someone already on the Australian Homestay Network, which is a very popular choice, an Australian family basically, or it can be someone who registers to be on that Australian Homestay Network specifically for that student. Okay. We do have some collateral in both English and Vietnamese. I'm sorry to our associates in Indonesia and Malaysia, I don't have collateral in uh, Bahasa, but uh, obviously English we do have. And for the associates we have in Vietnam, we do have some collateral in Vietnam, in Vietnamese, I should say, uh, in PDF form. And I'm just giving you an example of Kent Street Senior High School. This is what it kind of looks like. They're basically little, PDF flyers. They were designed to be printed um, and disseminated, but obviously we're not in country at the moment, so I'll send them to you electronically. Uh, and hopefully they can be useful for your offices to refer to electronically. Now, we'll just pause there to watch a quick video. Again, this is for our, um, this is for our uh, associates in Vietnam, I'm afraid, because this video is in Vietnamese. And uh, once we have watched it, um, I'll double check on the times with, uh, with Ivy and hopefully we have time to race through the TAFE section. Hopefully this will work. No, it didn't. It went straight back to my initial slide. So I'm gonna quickly skim through or back, I should say, through the TAFE slides and try and play that again. Tên tôi là Trần Phi Thịnh, tôi đến từ thành phố Hồ Chí Minh. Tôi đến Perth vào 2016, vào tháng 7. Tôi thích nhất thành phố Perth là đặc điểm, nó rất là bình yên. Cuộc sống ở đây nó rất là chậm, chậm rãi. À, nó khác với Sài Gòn là <cười> lúc nào mình cũng phải hối thúc dòng người thì cứ chảy, chảy và không có điểm dừng. Ở Perth thì tôi cảm thấy như tôi có thể ngồi, xu ngồi xuống và đi ăn với bạn bè và đi uống trà hoặc là đi chơi game nào đó mà tôi cảm thấy như tôi không có bị thúc đẩy bởi những cái điều gì đó tôi có thể thưởng thức cuộc sống Sau giờ học thì tôi thường hay đi tập võ với các bạn trong cùng trong lớp à, Tôi đang tập kickboxing Uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu và nó là một phần uh, thể thao mà nó rất là quan trọng đối với tôi bây giờ nó giúp cho tôi có thể thiền và suy nghĩ lại cuộc sống um, Cuối tuần thì tôi thường hay đi ăn với các bạn và tôi thích mì ramen Một đặc điểm tôi thích nhất ở Mount Dolly là về sự đa dạng và sắc tộc của học sinh và kể cả Um, giáo viên ở đây Giáo viên là một thành phần rất là quan trọng của Mount Lolly um, Họ đã giúp tôi có thể phát triển về tri thức và kính người của tôi Việc đi du học có thể giúp các bạn mở mang đầu óc hơn Nhiều người sẽ chọn Melbourne hoặc Sydney Nhưng Perth là một thành phố chậm rãi và yên bình hơn có thể giúp các bạn có một cuộc sống khác so với những thành phố lớn ở Việt Nam Vì theo mình nghĩ là thành phố Hồ Chí Minh mình nó rất là giống thành phố Sydney và Melbourne với việc là nó rất là bận rộn và hào phóng um, Perth thì nó chậm rãi hơn Okay, uh, so hopefully for our associates in Vietnam, that was uh, somewhat interesting. That was a, a student who uh, has since left Mount Lawley Senior High School and moved on to higher education here in Western Australia. But that was uh, a student at Mount Lawley Senior High School, which is a really, really good school. And you would have seen the lady at the end who was smiling, talking to the students. Her name is Pippa. She's one of the teachers at Mount Lawley Senior High School, but she's also the international coordinator and she's a very popular lady. Um, so that's the end of the school section. Like I said earlier, there's a lot to absorb about schools. 
come back to Ivy, uh, filter your questions through Ivy uh, or Bo for that matter, um, because they can pass them on to me and I'm here to help. And of course we can answer them today if we have time. And speaking of time, Ivy, do we have time to go through the TAFE International slides quickly? I hope yes, so. Yes, we can, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So after school, uh, students have a lot of options, of course, in Australia. One of those options is university. The other option is vocational studies, skills. Um, and that's where TAFE International Western Australia comes in. Skills is a very, very popular pursuit at the moment, not just amongst Australians, but international students. There's a big, big demand for skills. I'm just going to turn my pen back on. You've got a little uh, uh, preview of these slides as I accidentally skipped through them earlier. What is TAFE? Technical and Further Education is what it stands for. Technical and Further Education. There's a large vocational uh, sector in Australia, some private, some government. We are a government institution. So I'll come back to what that means in a moment, but basically across all of our courses, and we've got a lot of them, we've got over 130 different courses at the moment for international students. We basically do two things. We provide skills so that students can enter the workforce, or we provide skills so that students can pathway into university with credit and get a lot of very recognized part-time work when they're at university. Um, and pursue similar study areas at university, uh, similar to what they studied at TAFE. Government means excellent, excellent facilities. It means value for money. You know, our fees might be a little bit, little bit more than private vocational providers, but you've got to ask the question, why is it a little bit more? Well, the answer is fantastic facilities, individual learning, uh, great support structures, and I'll go on, I'll come on to that uh, in just a moment. But it all comes down to basically recognition. I can tell you now that most students who graduate from TAFE with a vocational qualification will be very well recognized in the employment sector. It's, uh, it's definitely the way to go if you wanna do vocational education. At TAFE Western Australia, we talk about colleges and campuses quite a lot. I'll explain the difference in, uh, between those in just a moment but they exist across a broad regional and metropolitan presence and i'll show you what i mean by that in just a moment but all of our campuses are in very convenient locations quite close to all the amenities you would need as a student public transport shops accommodation things like that we don't have any higher education programs ourselves, but we do have certificate diploma and advanced diploma programs and these diploma and advanced diploma programs typically lead into university with credit three very important points, and this comes back to that point about being government. Three very important points. Number one is that we are the largest education provider in Western Australia, much bigger even than Curtin University. So we have anywhere between 50,000 and 100,000 students enrolled at any given time across our campuses. Now, the majority of those are local students, but they uh, certainly before COVID was a sizable international student cohort, and we ho we're hoping that comes back. And that brings me to point number two, which is diversity. With that large number of local students and international students combined, we have great diversity in students and staff. You typically don't find that level of diversity at some of the smaller private vocational providers, but there is a lot of diversity at the TAFE colleges here in Western Australia. And point number three, being government owned means that we have a lot of history so being state government owned means we go back over a hundred years delivering skills to the West Australian workforce. We are very workforce focused. We are about filling the skills gaps wherever they are, not just for local students, but for international students as well. So colleges and campuses, what did I mean by colleges and campuses? When we talk about colleges, we are talking about four TAFE Western Australia colleges in which international students can enroll. Central, South, Regional, South, North Metropolitan. So across Central and South Regional colleges of TAFE Western Australia, the campuses are Geraldton, which belongs to Central Regional, and then Bunbury, Margaret River and Albany. They belong to South Regional. So those are campuses. And in the case of the two metropolitan colleges, which are in the city of Perth, those two metropolitan colleges have about 
15 to 20 campuses split between them. So north of the Swan River in the city of Perth is North Metropolitan TAFE, and south of the Swan River in the city of Perth is South Metropolitan TAFE. And if we have a look at an overhead view of three examples of our metropolitan colleges, you can see they are big, they are prominent. This is our Joondalup campus here, right next to Edith Cowan University. You can see it's pretty much the same size as Edith Cowan University, right next to one of Australia's largest shopping precincts and a public transport train station. Curtin University, this is the business faculty end of campus. And over here is the TAFE Bentley campus where I was yesterday having a look around our commercial cookery kitchens, but we do a lot more than just commercial cookery. But very close to our partner university, Curtin, very close to ECU, another partner. And our Murdoch campus, part of South Metropolitan TAFE, the College of South Metropolitan TAFE, Murdoch campus, very close to Murdoch University. So these are what we call education precincts. And if we go in, go in to ground level, you will see the Joondalup campus, is in a very picturesque setting with uh, water features and lots of trees and bushland. Murdoch is a very new dynamic purpose-built facility. And our very popular Northbridge campus, this is the one that is officially part of the Perth Cultural Centre, right in the CBD, very popular with international students. These are our umbrella course areas. Uh, I'm not going to go into them in great detail, but just cast your eyes over them. We teach courses that most vocational providers will teach, IT, business, engineering, stuff like that. And we teach it very, very well. We know what we're doing. But we also teach courses that are very unique to TAFE Western Australia, maritime, aquaculture, oil and gas, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. We've got a very unique program offering in some areas. Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning in our engineering program is very, very popular and very much in demand in Southeast Asia and Australia. Oil and gas, aquaculture. You know, aquaculture is about commercial fishing, basically, or fish farming, fish farming in a, in a sustainable way. We had a delegation visit from Baria Bungtao province uh, down in the south of Vietnam uh, about two years ago. And agreements are being signed with the West Australian government to work on all sorts of agriculture and aquaculture projects down in the south of Vietnam. So a big employment area for any country that has a coastline, aquaculture is rapidly growing as an employment sector and as an industry. Our creative industries suite is second to none. We have some amazing creative industries programs here. We've got IT, we are working on a cybersecurity offering, but to be honest with you, our software development and website development pathways into cyber security degrees with our partner universities are very, very good. We do have some community services, youth work, uh, games and animation is very popular. Nursing, incredibly popular, especially with Vietnamese students coming out of school here in Western Australia. The only hurdle they face is the IELTS requirement which is an IELTS of seven, no band below seven. And in fact, that's actually more achievable than a lot of international students think if they have come through the school system here in Western Australia. It often comes down to a confidence issue, but there are other tests you can do, occupational English test, Pearson test of English, TOEFL, uh, lots of different uh, options to achieve that uh, English requirement for nursing. But of course, the ever popular area of hospitality, cookery, patisserie. You know, patisserie is one of the highest paid careers uh, in the hospitality sector in Australia. As a patisserie chef at one of the major hotels, uh, you can be earning close to $160,000 a year, Australian dollars. It's an incredible, it's an incredible employment, employment sector. And here in Western Australia, they are crying out for skills and for employees. And on our South Metropolitan TAFE, Bentley campus, we actually hold a career fair twice a year where all the major hotel and hospitality chains come to our campus. We don't go to them, they come to us to meet with students and talk about employment opportunities. It's a very, very big fair. And I was just on our Bentley campus yesterday and it was heaving with activity. The restaurant was open, there were students everywhere, the kitchens were humming. Everything is going gangbusters here in Western Australia on the hospitality front. Just very quickly, some of our popular courses. 
uh, certificate three in commercial cookery. These are just examples. I'm not going to go through all 130. But certificate three in commercial cookery, it's a one-year program. It's $16,000 for one year. We deliver that currently in five different locations. Diploma of nursing, one and a half years, just under $27,000 for one and a half years of study, three different locations. And that diploma of nursing gives students sometimes over a year of credit, but usually at least a year of credit into Bachelor of Nursing or Bachelor of Science Nursing at our partner universities. Hospitality management, six month program, engineering, early childhood education and care. These are basically our top 10 courses at the moment. This might look a little different when we come out of uh, COVID, but these are basically our top 10 courses at the moment. Uh, going into um, our second sort of set of five uh, out of the top 10 carpentry, commercial cookery, as you can see, more engineering. We do automotive technology, light vehicle, mechanical, and early childhood education and care. The point I want to make here, which is an interesting one, is if you have any students onshore, whether they are at school or university or even at uh, in the vocational sector looking to extend their studies, like I said earlier, send them to Western Australia. Home Affairs is being reasonably flexible with onshore uh, visa renewals for students, even if they're stepping down a level in the qualifications framework, there is a, an amount of flexibility and an understanding that students don't really want to go home. So, uh, you know, talk to us about TAFE courses for your onshore students. Um, a very quick look at our nationality split, you know, between 2012 and 2019, our top 10 nationalities here at TAFE Western Australia look a lot different to how they did uh, last year. And this has probably changed a little bit this year as well. But I think this is going to be more or less the same as we come out of COVID. But we have a great diversity here in TAFE Western Australia. Not one of our nationalities here in our top 10 makes up more than 10% than of uh, our student cohort. Lots of Latin America, lots of Europe, France as well, Germany, Sweden. We've got a lot of North American students too. And Southeast Asia makes up a very big uh, number of our international students. So good diversity. These are our university partners, Curtin University and Edith Cowan. We do have packaging arrangements with them. We also have articulation arrangements with them. That basically means two different things, but it's very, very similar. A student can package one student visa all the way through TAFE through to the end of the university studies or they can avail one of our articulation arrangements. And that means they come to TAFE, they graduate, and then they explore their options afterwards. That doesn't have to be with one of these three universities. Most universities around Australia will recognize a TAFE qualification and typically offer credit. The only disadvantage here is having to apply for a second visa after they finish uh, their TAFE studies. So I would just encourage you guys and students to have a look at all the different credit arrangements and credit points to understand what is being offered by the university. It's definitely a student's market on that front. Universities would be uh, clamoring for international students. So, you know, haggle for your students and find the best credit offering. Uh, you can use our online university pathway finder. Again, I can send the link through Ivy later on. It's really just a guide. Uh, but always ask us what's available uh, because it's constantly being updated. But things like hospitality management, you know, one year of credit to Bachelor of Commerce at Edith Cowan University, or maybe even one year of credit to a Bachelor of Tourism and Hospit Hospitality Management or Bachelor of International Hotel and Resort Management at the same university. And, you know, students coming out of year 11 or year 12, whether it's Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, they could come to us. In some examples, they could come to us for just one year of study out of year 11 or 12. One year of study and then enter the second year at the university because they get 120 points. And that's around about $13,000, $14,000. This example is using business as an example. Compared to Edith Cowan University's direct entry or Edith Cowan College entry, much more expensive. And that's only available typically to, to year 12s. Otherwise, the pathway is longer. But for year 11s and year 12s, it's one year and then you enter into the second year. It's a very rough example, this, but the estimated total is about 63,000 Australian dollars, whereas going directly through a university foundation or directly into the university, it's much more expensive. So coming through TAFE, same time, but much cheaper, and you get 
dual qualifications. That helps with part-time employment in those final two years at university. I am conscious of time, so I'm gonna fly through these final slides here. Uh, I talked about value for money earlier on and being a government institution. It's not just about great facilities. It's about class size. It's about being student centered. It's about providing students workplace simulations on campus or giving them supervised work placements off campus. They will always have one of those two. And our facilities are always industry standard. That means we are con constantly updating so that we are matched to industry, whether it's a TV studio, or an automotive workshop or a commercial cookery facility. I was just on the Bentley campus yesterday with one of our academics and they pointed me, uh, they showed me the new um, barista classroom for commercial cookery students and hospitality students. There is a unit where you have to learn how to make coffee. Now I know you all love your coffee in Vietnam and we love our coffee here in Perth and you love your coffee in Indonesia and Malaysia as well. Believe it or not, Hospitality students doing that unit in barista uh, techniques have to learn to make 27 different types of coffees. So excellent, excellent tuition uh, and great facilities as well. But beyond that, that value for money applies to the support we provide. We have a lot of support available for students. I mentioned those career fairs we have that's not exclusive to hospitality. We do that in other areas as well. We have excellent industry connectivity with our lecturers um, and our supervised work placements. So the opportunities are always there for students to make a name for themselves. But the difference between TAFE and private vet is at TAFE, that ability to really excel individually. You're gonna be on your own workstation. You're gonna to have to achieve competency uh, yourself. You're not gonna be working in groups where you're watching someone do the task and having to try and remember how to do it, you're going to be doing the task yourself constantly throughout your studies at TAFE. We don't have our own accommodation available, but we do work with different partners, Murdoch and ECU. We have access to their on-campus accommodation. We also use Campus Perth and Student Housing. This is an example of Edith Cowan um, on-campus accommodation, and this is an example of Murdoch's, Murdoch University's on-campus accommodation. Campus Perth looks a bit like this. And the student housing company looks a bit like this. Very, very modern, very chic, very popular at the moment. I know it's almost, uh, well, it is 12 o'clock now here in Perth, 11 o'clock in Vietnam. Ivy, are we okay to continue? Uh, yes, I think we can quickly go through uh, the remaining. Yes. And, I'm uh, almost finished. I've only got about two slides left. In fact, I think this might even yeah. be the last slide and then we have a video. Yeah. Um, a quick COVID update for Western Australia. Again, I hope you're all safe and well and everything's okay in your respective countries. I know things, you know, in Malaysia, particularly, uh, it's a bit of a roller coaster ride for you at the moment, and I'm sorry about that. Um, in WA, in Western Australia, we, much like the rest of Australia, have a pretty good handle on COVID. We've only got two active cases at the moment in, in the two and a half million people we have here. And they are both in hotel quarantine. Um, over the last seven days, this line of numbers down here, we've only had, um, well, those two active cases have been returning travelers, but otherwise nothing. There's no community transmission, which is what we call a local case. Uh, and we're obviously working on our COVID-19 vaccine rollout, uh, just over 50,000 people fully vaccinated. It's going a little bit slowly here in Australia, but we'll get there. There is a bit of an issue with Victoria, uh, they have a bit of a roller coaster with COVID and, and borders are closed again, I think, between Western Australia and the state of Victoria. So interstate travel is on and off at the moment, but here in Western Australia, very low risk, very, very few restrictions in place. I'm in the office. Everyone's back in back in business. Uh, Ivy, a quick video or would you like me to send the video around afterwards? Uh, I think we can play it and then we jump to uh, the Q&A. Sure.
Okay, so um, that's, I just want to say one thing about that video. Everything you saw in there was, uh, was from a TAFE campus. So I know that's probably obvious in some of those clips, um, but things like the guy doing horticulture, all those plants, that's our horticulture facility on the Murdoch campus. The oil and gas plant, the guy you saw in his uh, fluorescent yellow jacket turning that big wheel, that oil and gas plant is actually on our campus. Um, the, the, the children you saw in the early childhood care center, that's actually on our campus, okay? All of that stuff is from our TAFE campuses. So thanks very much for listening, everyone. And I'm, uh, I think we've basically gone pretty much exactly an hour and I think we're going to Q&A yeah. now. So I'm gonna stop yeah. my slides and I'll turn my camera back on. Um, thank you very much, Michael, for your uh, great presentation. Absolute I think we pleasure. have one um, question coming up from uh, an analyst uh, attendee. So the waste qualification, uh, is it accepted in other states as well? Um, yeah. Yes, I, uh, I see that question in front of me. Thank you, anonymous attendee. Waste is 100% accepted in uh, all universities across Australia. Well, when I say waste, WACE stands for West Australian Certificate of Education. That is very similar to all the other states, as I said earlier. So Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, they all have their own, what they call Certificate of Education. So when you get WACE or when you get the South Australian Certificate of Education or whatever it is, you basically have finished year 12. But the question for university is whether, regardless of whether it's Western Australia, Victoria, or whatever, doesn't really matter which Australian system it is. The question is whether or not you were an ATAR student or a non-ATAR general student. So when you do WACE, you are either ATAR or non-ATAR general. And it's all about subject choice. So yes, mm -hmm. typically you can get into university uh, after WACE if you have an ATAR. And even if you don't, universities are quite flexible through their, through their alternative mm -hmm. pathways. And TAFE is always a pathway. University foundations, they're also a pathway, things like that. But yes, it's absolutely recognized. And waste is increasingly being delivered outside Australia in places uh, around Southeast Asia. So Saigon International College, for example, is delivering waste, the West Australian Certificate of Education. And here's a fun fact for you. Uh, we have another question. We'll come to that in a moment. Here's mm -hmm. a fun fact for you. The largest single cohort of West Australian Certificate of Education students anywhere in the world exists at Sunway College in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> hmm. Okay, that's very good. Um, I think we need, yeah. Uh, so if, if the student would like to study um, like during offshore time uh, when they cannot travel to, uh, to Australia, they can still study in the home country, right? Like, of course, yeah. So, you know, education, very, there are a lot of parallels across Southeast Asia. But, I mean, really, that applies to the rest of the world, Europe and North America, but Southeast Asia and Australia, there are a lot of parallels in the education system. It's mm -hmm. basically the same kindergarten up to year 12. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where a student chooses to do that and what pathway they, they follow is pretty much the same. It's just a question of, it becomes a destination question. Mm -hmm. Do I want to continue my schooling in Vietnam and then explore my studies in Australia? Do I want to continue my schooling in Indonesia and then explore my options? Or do I want to go for school? It's all about options. So, you know, if you want to come to Australia earlier and get a different experience, uh, notwithstanding borders being closed, uh, you know, some students choose to do that. Yeah. We've got another question down here. Sorry, Bo looks like he's warming up for a question too. Yes, I am. How did you know? Uh, I've got a couple of questions. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, online study options with both uh, the, the government schools and also um, the vocational programs? That's a very good question, Bo. Uh, and I guess um, that topic was noticeable by its absence in my presentation. Yes. <laughs> um, and that's because we actually don't really have any mm -hmm. online options available for any students at the moment. Yeah. I, I know that some of our uh, fellow TAFE colleges or, or TAFE providers around Australia have been dabbling in the world of online studies. So our our Brothers and sisters at TAFE Queensland, for example, TAFE Queensland and TAFE Western Australia are quite, mm -hmm. quite closely aligned. Mm -hmm. um, I think they've dabbled in online. I'm not sure how it's gone. We basically are not providing any online uh, courses on the TAFE, on the vocational front to anyone, anyone at the moment. 
We're mm-hmm. looking at accounting and bookkeeping within the business uh, uh, yes. realm, and uh, that might be available from July onwards. And strangely, we are also looking at conservation and land management. I don't know quite how that's going to work as an online subject, but we're also looking at delivering that online. Mm. But outside that, um, mm. we, we aren't delivering any vocational courses online. Elacos, we are English language for intensive co- English language yeah. intensive courses for overseas students. We are delivering online. Mm-hmm. There's basically two reasons for our hesitancy. Number one is we believe it's very difficult to, to maintain a very high standard of quality mm-hmm. with online provision. Mm-hmm. And number two, unfortunately, with borders being closed, mm. the West Australian government has reprioritized the TAFE sector here in Western Australia mm-hmm. uh, to focus on upskilling the West Australian population while we can. Mm-hmm. So there's been a big demand for uh, places amongst the local student population. That actually affects places for international students uh, in, mm. in the coming intake. So, so a lot of our courses have become smaller in terms mm. of uh, text. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm jabbering on. To answer the schools component of that, no, there's nothing available. Yeah, no problem. And yeah, so a lot of our um, partners will also have some onshore inquiries uh, as, as well. So you touched on a, a few of those uh, popular onshore uh, courses. What about so the payment of the COE? Is there any special promotion, or what? What would be the minimum amount to pay for for a COE? Because sometimes, in order to convert some students um, onshore, there, there, there tends to be prom- some promotions that do help us get some students over the line yeah. if the COE is cheap. Yeah, Bo, I'm so glad you asked that question because I actually was remiss of me not to include this in my presentation. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question, but the, but the two things I want to say about that. Mm-hmm. Number one, for onshore students, if you have onshore students, and I really hope you guys don't, I know you cross your your associates, I'm sure there's probably quite a few, whether it's private school, government school, uh, interstate, or whether it's another vocational provider or university, we are seeing a lot of students dropping out of university and coming to TAFE, and we're seeing a lot of university students finishing and coming to TAFE. So two things on that. Number one, yes, we do have an instalment plan uh, that we offer to students on a case-by-case basis, onshore students. Um, Typically, I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's a $1,000 payment to get the COE Mm -hmm. and then an installment plan after that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that ranges from $1,000 to $3,000 on -hmm. a case-by-case basis. So Mm -hmm. just check with us. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I think it's some, yeah, I think. Depends on the course. I think think it depends on the course and it depends on whether they're a continuing student, but we're quite flexible. So come to us. Mm -hmm. We we definitely have installment plans on offer. So basically that means you pay a deposit, get your COE, um, and then you pay your installments as you go through the mm. rest of that semester. So that's Fantastic. for onshore students. Mm. The second thing I want to say, in addition to installment plans, is that we do, because the next question might be about scholarships, we do not offer scholarships per se. What we offer at the moment to international students onshore, again, is mm-hmm. bursaries, what we call mm. bursaries. Now, they haven't been confirmed for semester two mm. this year just yet. We are hoping to get confirmation in the next week or so. But basically, semester one this year and then semester two last year, they had very similar bursaries on offer, which was effectively two thousand uh, dollars off your first year of study. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when you talk about commercial cookery at thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars a year, mm-hmm. whatever the course is, mm-hmm. two thousand dollars works out to be quite a lot. And in fact, I think for yeah. hospitality, it was actually $3,000, I'm mm, not mistaken. Quite a lot. So we're, we're hoping to announce the bursaries for July 2021 soon. Mm-hmm. And also for February 2022, at the same time, we're going to be looking at mm. bursaries. And again, that's for onshore students to try and encourage them to come. Mm. Uh, to yeah, where do you see the trend onshore for your programs? Is it commercial cookery? What what other programs would you re- would you recommend? Yeah, that slide I showed you earlier on of that top ten that one that top yeah. ten courses that was basically our top ten from the last okay, kind good. of two or three intakes. So, right. commercial cookery, uh, carpentry, very interestingly, carpentry a, a carpentry appears to be very popular with European students at the moment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, construction and engineering appears to be very popular with Latin American students at the moment. But for you guys, if your bread and butter is Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, or anywhere Southeast Asia, or even North mm-hmm. Asia, Far East, mm. uh, yes, things like hospitality, remedial massage is an interesting one, nursing, community services, early childhood education. Mm. Those are sort. Those are the sort of in-demand areas at the moment. But hospitality, Fantastic. honestly, is really, really gangbusters at the moment. You have. I can't remember if you have automotive uh, programs. We do. We have automotive technology. 
Okay. Um, it but starts... not popular. Not popular in Southeast Asia. Increasingly. Increasingly. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I, I would have thought maybe from Malaysia a little bit. Maybe. Absolutely, absolutely with Malaysia. It's on there. And so is business and engineering, quite generic with, with mm -hmm. Malaysia. Business and engineering has always been very popular. But automotive, you might have not seen it because I raced through that top 10 slide. Automotive was in there. Well, it was uh, there. Okay. It was, yeah. it was in there. It's a very Fantastic. popular course. Um, we have two campuses for automotive, and I've been to both of them. And they are, honestly, if you guys, whoever, whoever has a, a car, or if you have a little scooter, Ivy, I'm sure you've got a little scooter in Ho Chi Minh City. <laughs> I don't know how often you service it, but let me tell you something. You know, you go, to, you go to a service garage to go and service your scooter or your car, and there's a guy with greasy hands, and there's just a mess everywhere and tools everywhere. These automotive facilities, you might have seen a glimpse of them in the video. The TAFE Western Australia automotive facilities are like hospitals. They are so clean and so precise and mm -hmm. everything is structured. It's almost like a like an airport. Everything's got a, a direction and a line mm -hmm. and a place. It's amazing. Very good facility. That's good. That's really good to know. Fantastic. I told you I talked too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's good. Sorry. Guys. No, yeah. it's really it's good um, to hear those details. Yes, yes. So coming back to like uh, government school sector, uh, you mentioned that there's uh, a strict uh, in terms of like. Uh, the age uh, of the student. So, uh, because due to the COVID-19, uh, not a lot of students can, can travel except when they have, uh, when, when they have like the travel exemption. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, like not all the students can meet the requirement. So uh, for those students that's studying uh, in Vietnam or like waiting during this time, if they are uh, over 18 years old, uh, can can we still apply for um, for, for government school? Uh, like I know um, year 11 is, is the latest one that they, they can come, right? Yeah, you know, you can apply for government school mm -hmm. regardless of age. You're either going to be age appropriate to go into a mainstream government school or you're going to be age appropriate to go into one of our senior campuses so we've got uh, north lake senior campus mm -hmm. cyril jackson senior campus and there's one other i can't quite remember its name there's also canning college by the way mm -hmm. canning college is also part of the department of education mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they are what we call an independent public school but also very popular with international mm -hmm. students so yeah i mean a student doesn't need to stress basically a student working their way through school in their home country their option is, unfortunately with COVID, their option is to finish school in their home country and then come into mm -hmm. either TAFE or university when mm -hmm. they get to Australia. Or if the borders open and they are still going through school, they either come here to do uh, a mainstream year, nine, year 10, year 11, or whatever it is, or if they are slightly too old, they just go into Cyril Jackson Senior Campus or North mm -hmm. Senior Campus. Mm -hmm. um, they go wherever they are age appropriate, yeah. but rest assured there's always gonna be a place but I'm assuming that most students are not going to be sitting there in, let's say, year 11 right now in Ho Chi Minh City yeah. and say, you know what, I'm going to stop school for a year and then mm -hmm. I'm going to carry on. Yeah. I would just yeah. encourage all students to, to keep their pathway keep, going uh, yeah. and, and not have any gaps as, as their place. wherever they can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. But there's always an option, Ivy, absolutely. Whether it's a senior campus or whether it's a, um, a regulation school, it's all about age. Right. So uh, you mentioned like in one of the example uh, for so students that's studying uh, IEC and mainstream. Um, so like there are some students that ha might have like, you know, like a little bit lower English. So what are the maximum weeks for a uh, student to study packaging like early class and in the mainstream? Don't that forget you would yeah. yeah, yeah. Don't forget ELACOS is a term we refuse to, uh, sorry, refuse. We refer, <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of yeah. visa refusals. Um, yeah. Elocos is a term we use to refer to the English students do before TAFE or before university. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Whereas IEC is the term we refer to English that students are going to be doing if they need to at the mm -hmm. same time as their schooling, their, their, their government schooling, their year 10 or year 11 or year 12. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah. If you're talking about ELACOS before TAFE or before university. I, I, uh, I mean, I, IEC. You're talking about IEC. Yeah. yeah. So IEC, once again, as I said earlier on, don't forget that IEC is done concurrently with the academic subjects at school. It's not, a, it's mm -hmm. not like ELACOS where you do English and then university or mm -hmm. then TAFE. You do IEC at the same time as your school. Now, mm. we typically prescribe, unless in very unique circumstances, let's say a, a student from an international school, for example, in whichever country has an IELTS of eight, 7.5 or whatever it is, 
usually yeah. we usually we can be flexible around that. But by and large, what we do is we prescribe 40 weeks of English, which is one year of effectively one year of English in that IEC. But that is taught concurrently with mm -hmm. the academic subjects. Yeah. So there's no time. It's not 40 weeks in addition to school. It's 40 weeks at the same time. Mm -hmm. But what usually happens, and I've never seen anyone have more than 40 weeks prescribed uh, as, mm -hmm. as IEC. In fact, it's often quite a, quite a lot less. But what usually mm -hmm. happens is, whether it's less or whether it's 40 weeks, it doesn't really matter. What usually happens is students enter school, and as they progress through that IEC, their English gets to a certain level, and then the school says, that's it, you don't need to be an IEC anymore. We are very fair to international students. We don't make them pay more for IEC if they don't need it. They get tested and assessed on an ongoing basis, and then it's a matter of right. saying, hey, uh, young lady or young man, um, you know, your English is good enough to, to, to leave the IEC and focus on your mainstream studies, mm -hmm. so... Tell your mm -hmm. mum and dad they don't need to be paying for IEC anymore. Mm -hmm. That's that's really good. Yeah, the student doesn't have to waste any time, like other than studying together uh, the mainstream and, and English at the same time. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it for uh, from me. Uh, Bo, yeah. do you have any other question? No, that's it. I think that's good and. Um... Yeah. Very detailed uh, presentation from Michael. Eh? <laughs> yes, well, very fruitful today. And I hope everyone today across our different regions got a great experience out of today and has a better understanding of um, Tiwa and Western Australia in general as well. So don't forget to get in, in touch with me and Ivy or your local member in your country for more information. Yes, please, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to Yes Education. For Thank being, you, uh, for yeah. being, you know, I want to say quite new supporters. I know you've you've been an agent of ours for uh, quite a few years now, um, and certainly one with uh, broad reach and uh, a level of enthusiasm I have not seen from many other partners. I got to tell you. So thanks very much. Great. Um, Thank you very much. Support guys, and hopefully get to see you in person uh, soon. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, yes. yes. All right, and thanks for your support too, and we'll be in touch with you if, if we need any. Always more. stay in touch with any help. Yes. Great. Thanks yeah. a lot yeah. to everybody okay. who attended. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thanks. Very good. Bye. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.